What on earth do order stability and security look like in, in what's the world's most notorious failed state? And come to that, why on earth includes Somalia in the discussion today? Well, admittedly, it's extreme, yes, but it's also self-limiting. And I think it offers some insight into the fundamentals of some of those points that James was touching on. Admittedly, Somalia, well, it's now 30 years since Somalia first topped what was then called the Failed States Index. It's now the fragile state, which is arguably more perhaps accurate. Um, and it's now number two behind Yemen. So it's up better, but not too good. And it's still at the bottom of Transparency International's uh, Index of Corruption. It's number 179 when Denmark's number one. OK, so Somalia has no longer got quite so many warlords, or overt warlords and wars, but there are still weekly examples of bombs, assassination, grenades. I mean, seven, a family of seven was killed in southwest yesterday. If you think about this, trying to make sense of this from certainly a policy uh, point of view is extraordinarily difficult. And I think, to be honest, we can only sympathise with the international advisors and practitioners who are expected to make sense of it and all the while introduce projects or implement projects intended to change the way Somalia operates. And incidentally, by Somalia, I'm just using that as a generic term. Yes, Somaliland, I do take it separate, but I don't want to, to spend too much time uh, distinguishing every, every time it's mentioned. So anyway, local advisors, yes, big problems, international advisors, that is, because they rarely speak local or understand local languages. They rarely leave the safety of Mogadishu airport, and they're only in post for a very short time. Unsurprisingly, most draw on their exp experience from their home, wherever home is. And for the best of reasons, they advocate the norms, the processes, the institutions and so on that they have at home in the rich industrialized democracies that, that tend to support these kind of operations. And if home is the an EU member state or the US, well, they're probably not going to understand very much about the ways in which China or Turkey thinks about these matters. And those two are really rather important because they're seriously interested in Somalia's resources. I mean, all of this suggests that simply using terms such as order, stability and security don't actually take us very far. So I can't do anything other than support James's contention that we ought to think a little bit more imaginatively, a little bit more analytically, about not only what we mean by these very politicized terms, but also how they relate to each other. Because I think it's only then that we can begin to understand what on earth is going on in somewhere like Somalia. And um, if we think about the dynamics, by which I just mean the factors producing movement and change and possibly tipping points if we're really lucky, then, well, basically there aren't any definitive answers. But the key arguably, I think, lies in the fact that these characteristics do, as James stressed, interact. And although it's extremely difficult to pin that down, to analyze it and so forth, it's probably the best chance of trying to understand what's really going on. So I want to just cover four basic questions in the next 20 minutes and one practical example. So first question for me, if I was thinking about this, is why Somalia? It's really interesting from our perspective today because it's so chronically insecure and unstable, no matter how you define these terms. It's also displaying a quite remarkable degree of resilience and order, as in the agreement about social and cultural rules. I mean, admittedly, Jet Somalia has actually changed an awful lot in the recent years. After some 20 years of conflict and violence, the country adopted a provisional constitution in 2012 it elected what has elected internationally acceptable presidents. It's enacted a wide range of positive fiscal, political, social and economic reforms, allowing it to engage with donors and creditors, even if practical results haven't been quite what was wanted. I mean, most recently, 2020 saw the IMF announce that Somalia had taken the necessary steps to, be, steps to begin receiving debt relief. It's quite a change, actually, isn't it? all of which gives confidence to donors and foreign investors. But, and this is a personal view, it's all built on chronic insecurity. And it's all to some extent a facade. So my second question is, why insecurity? Well, it doesn't really matter how you define insecurity. It doesn't matter whether you say it's state, human, environmental, or whatever security. Somalia's got it all, Somalia's got it all from locusts, floods, cyclones, cholera, and youth unemployment and alienation to physical violence over 
land or stock disputes, everything in between, plus, of course, Al-Shabaab, which is actually part of society and has many, many sympathizers in not only the security actors uh, shaping this environment but, or influencing this environment, but also in the government institutions. And I would put institutions in quotes because I don't find them that real. So it's OK for the president to talk about uh, with declaring that with US assistance, Somalia's quote, on the brink of defeating al-Shabaab, but the regularity of its attacks and the civilian casualties in court caused suggest otherwise. I mean, I think it's quite interesting that US military leaders have actually conceded that it's not possible to defeat al-Shabaab militarily, not least because it maintains a fully fledged government system with governors, tax collectors and judges for each region. And of course, it enforces its decisions ruthlessly which is arguably more than can be said about the federal government in Mogadishu. So despite what the EU and the UN etc. might have us believe, I don't think there are any signs that civilian governance is going to improve for the foreseeable future. Why? Well, because partly at least security is a means rather than end. It's as much a means to power and aggrandizement as it is to stability, personal safety and development. If you want a superb um, book illustrating this, I suggest you have a look at Dewell, Alex Dewell's uh, The Real Politics of the Horn of Africa, because he, he I think, offers a very persuasive argument. So why security insecurity? Well, Somalia's experience also offers a salutary reminder that there's yet no coherent and comprehensible understanding of all the types of security involved. There is no one definition that actually encompasses all we're talking about. Which leads me on to my third question, why stability? It seems crazy given what Somalia is like. Well, I suggest that actually Somali entities are curiously stable and their society is resilient despite everything. Because, and this is where I can actually bin my notes because James has already covered it, um, it's all to do with predictability and the tacit, the, un, the unwritten rules being known by the most active, uh, would we use players, actors? You name it, it doesn't really matter. And those changes that they might introduce don't, provoke, don't produce large irreversible changes. So basically, anything that's done today isn't, doesn't leave a Somalia that's essentially different from the original. Whether the original is, 2012, is, is 1992, well, yes, rather different to that, perhaps. But 2012, not so sure. 2015, 2017? It couldn't be otherwise in what's actually a very parochial and conservative society, one in which there's low literacy rates and institutions mean very little. Number four of my questions, why order? And James has already stressed that this is a fetishized concept. It's open-ended, etc., etc. So I think once again, I can actually bin my notes on that. Um, he stressed the fact that it requires the agreed set of rules, yes, couldn't, couldn't, uh, could, wouldn't disagree with that at all. The only thing I would add, which obviously he hasn't, uh, didn't mention because his point was rather different, is that um, we, if we're talking about somewhere like Somalia, we also need to acknowledge the fact that there are other alternative forms of order, particularly in relation to legal pluralism. So statutory, customary and religious frameworks are all coexist and intertwined. So order like security and stability can't actually be treated as a substantive entity on its own. It's all about construction. So I think we can agree with that. In other words, I suppose order concerns behavior and consequences that display predictability. Um, this suggests, like for me, like for James, that order like security is ultimately about relations of power and the patterns they form. And he's expressed that so well that I, I, can, I can just leave it at that point. So leaving aside what might be called analytical speculation, um, there is an impediment to support this. So I want to now look at some examples from uh, what's basically a three-year, or, or rather what was a three-year donor-supported project introducing basic leasing into Kismayo and Baidoa, 2014 to 2017. Yes, it's passed, but actually that means we can look back and see it fairly clearly. Both cities were economic centres in the new federal states, 
several hundred miles away from Mogadishu. So they offer a slightly different perspective to the usual one that we get on, on what's happened when, it's, when life and everything else centres on Mogadishu. I think the key points here are that both cities were to some extent insecure, while the political fluidity of the developing new states they represented sometimes exacerbated instability. So it's quite a, an interesting example to use for order and the relationship between these various elements because it was rather messy, to put it mildly. And there was, I think, very clearly, despite the insecurity, a strong awareness of local acceptable order, and it's that which dominated. In practice, it meant that clan-related calculations influenced absolutely everything. So I ought to stress, actually, that while clan identity is an important factor in this complexity, it's not the element driving conflict as such, and it's very often used to mask elite economic, political, and ideological interests, which is one way that suggests that actually Somalia's extremism nevertheless has, has insights that can apply to other federal states. I mean, the dynamics are at play, I think, are particularly evident in three issues that I looked at. And please forgive me for the fact that I was looking purely at the policing side, but this was all very kindly funded by the EU, so uh, they had their expectations. Anyway, when it comes to policing in somewhere like Somalia and other fragile states, the really key issues and those basic forms of policing are recruitment of the would-be policemen, and they do tend to be policemen, their reward, i.e. stipends, and their retention, which tends to be the neglected item today. In practice, these three elements actually really do offer some very useful um, insights into the way in which the dynamics of, of the fundamentals of policing actually operate. I think I can use as an example a phase of vetting and selection for the Jubaland police in Kismayo in May 2016, because it's representative of the process and also the points that I want to, to draw out. I mean, actually, the details don't matter too much here. But the key thing is that um, the key thing is that if we think, or rather donors thought at the time that some 200 recruits were needed, then they had to decide on how they were going to be chosen. Um, and that's where clan really came into it, regardless of whatever the bureaucratic and politicized niceties were, because although many applicants were actually ineligible for joining the police because they were unfit, they were illiterate, you know, many didn't have the high school education specified in their advertisements, or they, or they were from the wrong clan. Clan representation usually superseded everything else, including literacy. And there's 40 percent of those selected were actually illiterate. But they were selected, <coughs> excuse me, because their inclusion helped to ensure community participation. In other words, the Somalis were only, well, only too well aware of what the social order, the political order, and the economy of insecurity, if you like, may, means in a town like Kismayo. Residents often told researchers at the time that clan calculations should be removed from decision making, but actually it's really not clear what on earth could, be, could replace it. It was, and it still is, and it will be, I suggest, a key indicator. So we can't over overestimate the clan issues affecting this. And there's a lovely example just to back this up from a, a man called Joseph Steigman, an American who was training SNA troops in the Somali National Army troops in basic logistics in Mogadishu. And he found that clan alignment and corruption affected every aspect of his trainees' lives. And this is a real practical example of the importance of order. Relationships were based on power rather than on professional recognition. And any form of disciplinary procedure, over weapons searches, for example, was resented. And there were similar problems, actually, in the, the police training camps. Interestingly, this is a bit of an aside, uh, Stegman published a wonderful article on this in Small Walls, the online journal Small Walls. But it obviously upset somebody because it was removed within about two hours. But I think it's the most honest example I've come across of just what responses can be to internationally top-down imposed forms of order, if you like. So if the new police were to symbolize the new order, then another key act, a key indicator, and possibly actually the most important one that tends to be neglected the most, is actually that of retention. That really does show the links between order and security. So in Baidoa, for example, 600 officers were initially recruited, but by February 2017, i.e. less than a year later, 
number was down to 547. Okay, this just represents an attrition rate of about 9%, which is acceptable in international standards of security forces in developing states. But it's the factors that prompted desertion that I think reflect the harsh insecurity confronted by new police in what remains a very, what, basic form of order. Okay, the reasons for um, desertion included dissatisfaction from those moved around from their home villages, inadequate command structures, but harsh deployment measures to frontline positions certainly played a key role. And this, of course, was what was expected by those with influence. It was their perceptions of what was appropriate or what they were able to enforce when it came to order. So in February 2017, for example, some 88 police officers who, don't forget, are, have minimal training, they might actually be very experienced militia, but they have minimal training, and more to the point, they have minimal ammunition. So some 88 officers were deployed indefinitely and on an ad, on an ad hoc basis to frontline posts on the outskirts of Baidoa. They lacked basic food, they lacked water, they lacked medical supplies, and they were under constant attack. And those who passed as their bosses found this unobjectionable. It's a very, very different understanding of how society and certainly military related matters, security related matters operate. So just to conclude at this point, while internationally acceptable expressions of security and stability offer insights, I think insecurity and conflict tend to revolve around each party's ability to provide constituencies with predictable and central capable governance of some description from which they derive legitimacy and support, and preferably actually weapons, water and food, if they're policemen. But order doesn't actually depend on security or stability, welcome though they may be. I can't stress too strongly, as James did, that the three aren't mutually dependent or mutually reinforcing. So understood in this sense, order is the result of an agreed set of rules, regardless of whether they result in security or stability. It's also whatever the strongest actor says it is. An accurate analysis, I suggest, needs to accommodate this. Thank you.